Film 97. This week, Julia Roberts tries to sabotage arrangements for my best friend's wedding. Toby Stevens is photographing fairies, though not necessarily at the bottom of his garden, and I'll be talking to Mike Lee about career girls. Good evening. My best friend's wedding has been a big hit in America, and I can't really think why. Maybe people turn to it out of revulsion against the intellectual poverty of the blockbusters, because at least it has a cogent story, if not a particularly attractive one. Julia Roberts is a successful restaurant critic whose longtime best friend, sports writer Dermot Mulroney, suddenly announces that he's going to marry wealthy young Cameron Diaz. Until now, Roberts has not wanted to marry Mulroney herself, but equally, she doesn't want him marrying anyone else. So, invited by the trusting Diaz to be matron of honour, Roberts tells her editor and other close friend, the gay Rupert Everett, that she's going to wreck the wedding and steal the bridegroom. Since Diaz is sweet but dim, this would seem a doddle for someone as ruthless as Roberts, but wouldn't you know it, all her attempts to belittle the bride-to-be and even inflame Mulroney's jealousy by pretending that she and Everett are engaged rebound against her until the wedding day itself. Well, uh, I guess it's just the way that you always talked about George. They always seemed, seemed like, um, it sounded like George was gay. Actually, yes. Exactly. <laughs> Common misconception. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Because, because George likes to pretend that he's gay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why would you do that? Oh, I find it attracts women. Indeed, yes. Worked for me. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> So, OK, what's wrong with all this? After all, it's a romantic comedy with an unusual twist. Not badly written by Ronald Bass and not badly directed by P.J. Hogan, who made Muriel's Wedding. Well, several things are wrong. For a start, Mulroney is so lacking in charisma that it's difficult to believe that these beautiful women would fight over him, unless each was insisting that the other should have him. But more importantly, there's a sour taste to the whole proceedings. This is not a simple jolly case of all's fair in love and war, and Roberts is not a basically decent girl who's belatedly, agonisingly discovered that she's about to lose the love of her life. True, she takes her reverses graciously enough, but that's only because if she didn't, she'd be the heavy and not the supposed heroine. In fact, she's just a bitch in the manger, happily prepared to ruin another woman's life and happiness out of little more than envy. Not really a nice person at all, no matter how hard the script tries to make her lovable. Among the cast, only Everett seems to have any inkling of this, but sadly, he's not around often enough to make the point forcibly. And that's our loss, actually, because while Roberts and Diaz are both pretty good and show more versatility than one might have expected of either, the excellent Everett, whose career of late hasn't been much to write home about, is the true star of the film. If there'd been more of him and less of Mulroney, everyone would have benefited. Oh my God, race you to the altar. <clears throat> Underplay. Got it. Hey! I'm Jules's fiance, George. <laughs> Just in time for a quick pre conjugal visit, if you catch my drift. I do. <laughs> You're going to humiliate me, aren't you? Only if I can. Okay, just one thing stay away from me. <laughs> Against God's plan? No! Oh, no! This is wonderful! It's wonderful! Oh, no! No! You have to meet George. George. You must be Kimmy's little sister. Oh. <laughs> Julian's fiance, they're going to be married. No. Yes. What's going on? Julian's getting married. Oh, no. Why didn't you tell us? Oh, I wanted to 
wanted to. I wanted to shout it from the rooftops, but Jules said no. Pumpkin, no. This is Kimmy's day. Let's not take the attention away from Kimmy. Oh. Oh. Dear, sweet, adorable, chocolate-covered Kimmy. Those were her very words. I think I'm gonna cry. Me too. <laughs> George, this is so sweet of you to come to our rehearsal. I insist you stay on to lunch. Oh, yes. No, 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 absolutely. Love to. <laughs> love the bag, love the shoes, love everything. Love to. Thank you. But the... Darling, what about your flight? Cancelled. And that should do old Roop's career no end of good. Now, though, for a look at the top ten films in Britain. At 10, Romy and Michelle's high school reunion. Mira Savino and Lisa Kudrow reinvent themselves as successful inventors. 9, Speed 2, Sandra Bullock all at sea in a pointless sequel to Jan de Bont's far superior original. At 8, The Lost World, another sequel, this time to Jurassic Park. Will this species of film ever become extinct? And 7, Mrs Brown, Billy Connolly and Judi Dench enjoy a royal friendship in a small gem of a movie. Six is Event Horizon. Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill and Jolie Richardson do battle with a spaceship from hell. At five, Conspiracy Theory. Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts swap paranoid fantasies in a rather disappointing political thriller. And four, Bean. Rowan Atkinson's eponymous nerd wreaks his unique brand of havoc, this time in Los Angeles. At three, Men in Black, Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith continue to protect the Earth from the scum of the universe. Two is Austin Powers, oddball spy Mike Myers swaps the swinging 60s for the naughty 90s and spoofs it up with Elizabeth Hurley. And at number one, the full Monty, Robert Carlyle gets his kit off in Peter Catania's comedy about Sheffield steelworkers bearing all. And so to Mike Lee, whose last film, Secrets and Lies, won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, three BAFTAs and five Oscar nominations. How do you top that? Wisely, Lee hasn't even attempted to do so. His new film, Career Girls, is deliberately a much smaller enterprise, which in present time and flashback studies the relationship between two young women, the brittle, aggressive Catherine Cartledge and the initially edgy, dermatitis-ridden and painfully shy Linda Stedman. The pair meet first as flatmates, students at North London Polytechnic, then later, six years after graduation, at a Getting to Know You Again weekend at Cartledge's London flat. It's a film that relies heavily and yet naturally on coincidence as the now more mature career women encounter briefly, sadly, or in the case of Joe Tucker, an estate agent who in their college days had betrayed them both painfully, various people neither of them had seen for years. But this is essentially a two-hander in which there gradually emerges a portrait of two young women, neither at first at all attractive, who in their different ways are both vulnerable but trying to hide it, both scarred from childhood experience and both bravely and quietly battling on no matter how much reality confounds expectation. It's one of Mike Lee's familiar slices of life in which, as usual, we are flies on the wall, closely observing the proceedings, and it's very well acted by Cartledge and Stedman. Hello? Hiya. Hiya. Come in, girl. Look, if this is inconvenient, you know. No, 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 I'm just brushing my teeth, that's all. Come in. Come in. Door straight out. Hello. What? You've gotten upstairs? Yes, uh, split level. 600 square feet each floor. So this must be the original artwork Jerry was telling me about. Lady Godiva. No, no, that's my ex-girlfriend, eh? Well, at least you have to look up to her. Hang on a sec. Fancy a cup of tea? Uh, no, thanks, cos we can't stay very long, actually. No, that's right. How about beer? No, thank you. Glass of wine? Uh, no, thanks. I'll have a bottle, come on. <coughs> uh, is that a microwave? Microwave oven hob. So, you are off the breast, then. Feel free to look around. Oh, my God, look at this. Oh, hammock. Yeah, yeah. Fancy sweet? No, I'll be sick. I suppose on a clear day, you can see the class struggle from here. Yeah, on a clear day, you can see forever, love. It's like a part hole. Yeah, it's a shit effect. Oh. Smoke? Ah, uh, no, thanks. Snout? And what is through the round window? Blinding view. Right then, with this scene thus set, let's hear from Mike Lee, who came into the studio to talk to me last week. Mike, career girls, where did the idea come from? 
<coughs> well, it's sort of, I mean, I wish I could say it was an idea, but it's sort of pl me plugging into ongoing preoccupations with things like, you know, the fact that we all get older and yet we stay the same. I mean, I've been watching your programme for a very long time and you're still the slightly long-haired youthful person Aww. that, that uh, I remember on Late Night Lineup. Oh, and it really is... Sweet. Five, <laughs> no, no, but yeah. really, five minutes with you and it's still the same old yeah. 60s you. And I think that's what's fascinating. And, um, and I am fascinated with the way that the past relates to the present. And, of course, my last film, Secrets and Lies, if I admit it, of course, is also about the past and the present. Yeah. So I'm kind of plugging back into those things. In my preparatory rehearsals that I always do for my films, I always, whatever the film winds up being, I always have the actors live through years and years of the development of the characters, and I sit in those preparatory rehearsals before the shoot, seeing them, you know, when they're quite young, getting slowly older and older, you see. And then finally we get to time present, and I drop anchor, and we tell the story, and very often they refer back to those things, but the audience only hears about them, they never actually see the audience, never, you never actually see them. So I thought it would be fun for once to ask you to jump into a time machine with the movie camera and pop back and uh, share all that with you a bit, really. It's funny, but all these memories keep flooding back. See, I hate looking back. Yeah, but don't forget, I don't remember my childhood, you know, and that's why remembering's so important to me. Oh. Who wants a crap memory, though? As a filmmaker, it's very stimulating to having painted, to, to, to go from a quite broad canvas to have the opportunity to tell a tighter, shorter story. Um, it, you know, it just gives you the opportunity to explore things, really. You've got splendid performances from your two leading ladies, Catherine Cartledge and, and Linda Stedman. Um, how did, well, did you have them in mind when you started on this film or not? Yes, I mean, I assemble the whole group of actors and I certainly, having worked with Catherine before, she of course was memorably the nutty goth in Naked, <coughs> and of course has been in other films like um, Breaking the Waves. Um, knowing that she was there, I just knew that there was the opportunity to explore and do something fairly extraordinary. And Linda Stedman, who is new, I mean, to me, although yeah. Viewers will be very familiar with her from various television series, uh, including uh, Between the Lines and Thief Takers. Um, simply, I just knew that they'd be a good combination together, and we developed the thing. Um, and indeed, it turned out that their characters, um, Hannah and Annie, are a great duo. Yes, they, they do bounce off each other very well. Um, one thing that impressed me very much at the beginning, you don't go out of your way to make these people attractive. In fact, they're not attractive at the beginning, are they? W was that deliberate? <coughs> yes, but it, it arises from, the, from you know, what the film is about. I mean, um, I wanted to make a film about the journey that we make between 20 and 30. Um, and I think that that particular decade is a much, more, is a much longer journey than the journey you make between 30 and 40 or 40 and 50, uh, for example. Um, when, you know, when we're sort of 18, 19, 20, 21, we're sort of, we seem to be grown-ups. I mean, we are, you know, grown-up size and we sort of live in the grown-up world, but we're still sort of piecing ourselves together. I mean, we're still experimenting with the bits. You know, we haven't quite sorted out who we are or how to be who we think we are or how to be who we think we want to be and so forth. And so when you see um, Hannah and Annie, and indeed the other characters in the flashbacks when they're yeah. at student age, they are very much... Um, you know, trying to find themselves. That's a porky pie, isn't it? Mr. Ricky Richard. What's his surname? Burton. Burton. Richard Burton, didn't I tell you? No. Yeah, it's, uh... You're joking, aren't you? No, really. <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, look like him or anything. You I... can say that again. <gasps> no, um, me uh, mum used to fancy him when... He was lovely. Well, let's just hope you don't end up like him then. <sighs> Do you feel that you are getting more recognition now than you had in, in, in previous times? Because I know that you often complain, I think very rightly, that your films were not given anything right, like the right kind of distribution, treated as art house movies in their own country. Is that changing? I hope it's changing. It is difficult um, getting British films distributed properly and exhibited sufficiently in the UK, particularly outside London. Why? Well, you know, talk to the distributors, mm. talk to the exhibitors. I mean, there's still a notion that, you know, movies equals Hollywood, and we're all 
making films that, I mean, and it's not just me, it's not just Ken Loach. I mean, there's a huge amount of production yeah. going on now, and it's very good, it's very positive. I hope it's changing, I hope it will change. I think it is, but I don't want to become too complacent. Well, um, what are the auspices like for Career Girls? Is, 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 does that look as if it's going to get a better distribution than it would have done a few years Barry, ago? I hope so. I don't know. I, I look forward to it. I, I have, we have the word of the distributors that they will do their best. And we hope that their best is better than the best they did for Secrets and Lies. If there's only one screening or no screenings at yeah. all, it's just not good enough, really. Well, I hope that doesn't happen to career girls. I, I, will, I will now recommend it to people. So they, there you go. Thank but you. No, I, I did enjoy the film very much, so good luck with it, Mike. Thank you. As a matter of fact, Career Girls is already doing very nicely in America. Well, that brings us to photographing fairies, which seems to have been inspired by the famous, now infamous, photograph of fairies, allegedly taken by two little girls in 1917. In 1983, one of those girls, by then 81, admitted that the picture was a hoax. But in its time, it completely fooled, among others, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle, played by Edward Hardwick, appears in the new film, but the protagonist is Toby Stevens, a photographer who, just before the First World War, loses his bride of one day in an accident on a Swiss mountain and never ceases to mourn her. After the war, Frances Barber, wife of the Reverend Ben Kingsley, brings him a photograph, purportedly showing the fairies with whom her daughters claim to play. Stevens, a non-believer in all matters religious, spiritual and fantastical, is at first a sceptic, but something about the picture intrigues him, and he goes to Barber's home village to investigate. There, he discovers that the children see the fairies after eating a strange flower, so Stevens eats one as well, and lo and behold, he too sees the fairies, who are all female, well, except for the fat, bald one, not particularly friendly, and look rather like pouty lolitas. But by this time, Barbara's died after falling from the tree where the fairies loiter, and Stevens has aroused both the enmity of the slightly sinister Reverend Kingsley, who's jealous of the fairy paparazzo's relationship with his wife, and the carnal fancy of the girl's governess, Emily Wolfe. Stevens, however, is now so obsessed by what he deems to be the reality of the fairies that he cares little for anyone or anything, including his business and his partner come assistant, Phil Davis. What the bloody hell have you been up to? I used a condenserless enlarger with a 150 watt light source. The print was made on collodion self-turning paper. The maximum enlargement was no sign of tempering. No brush strokes, no disturbance of the emulsion. That's amazing, sir. You know the partners are due at any minute. Comparisons of the outline show that the, uh, the blur is laterally, not vertically inverted. True reflection, in other words. The partners, Charles! You do follow me, Roy. Look at her eye. The, the, the image, the, the blur, is reflected in the girl's eye. The largest commission of the month and you go barming! It really was something in her hand, something moving too fast for the shutter speed. Well, give us some sort of a hand, then. I wonder what she used. Double exposure. Puzzling cutout. What did you do in the developing day? Don't you see, Roy? She would have had to be a master, an artist, but she didn't know anything about photography. Well, perhaps she's bloody queen of the fairies. Who knows? But I'll tell you one thing I do know. Three Freemasons with more money than sense are expecting Charles Castle, photographic artiste, to take a picture of them that they can hang on their wall without giving their customers nightmares. <clears throat> Stevens has become a convert, convinced that fairies are messengers between this world and the next, and that through them he can be reunited with his own late lamented wife. All this leads to a violent death and a legal execution. It's a strange tale that takes in illusion and delusion, the power of love, faith and obsession, and the effect of mind-bending drugs. Did Stevens really see fairies, or did the strange flowers simply induce hallucinations? The film is intriguing and unusual enough to retain your interest, and quite nicely directed by Nick Willing, though he and his co-writer Chris Harold saddled the talented Toby Stevens with a decidedly one-note role. As for the fairies created by Ron Muick, well, some people say they don't look authentic. I wouldn't know. I don't hang out much with fairies, especially fat bald ones, but they looked okay to me. So let's get on to the competition. The answer to last week's question is that the member of the cast of Air Force One, who'd previously portrayed a presidential assassin, was Gary Oldman, who played Lee Harvey Oswald in JFK. The first correct answer drawn from the hat came from Brian Brooks of Glasgow, who wins the film 97 Sweatshirt and a year's free cinema going. This week's question is, in which film, apart of course from My Best Friend's Wedding, did both Julia Roberts and Rupert Everett appear? If you think you know, phone 0894 11 
before midnight on Sunday. That's 0894 11 44 11. But now for our weekly report. Head above water is a black comedy about a judge, his wife, her ex-lover, the boy next door and a dead body that won't go away. Well, you know, exactly the sort of everyday problems we all face. The film was directed by Jim Wilson, a long-time associate of Kevin Costner and Oscar-winning producer of Dances with Wolves as well as The Bodyguard. Head Above Water stars Cameron Diaz and Harvey Keitel. Tom Brook joined cast and crew on location in Maine. For his directorial debut, big-time Oscar-winning Hollywood producer Jim Wilson chose a low-budget project, a dark comedy involving just a small car set on a tiny island off the coast of Maine. I love the notion of five individuals on a small island, um, and it, it appealed to me, the dark humor. It, it's, it's, a, it's a black comedy. Uh, some people get into real trouble and a few have fatalities, but also there was a tremendous sense of humor to the piece that I, I thought was there and I thought I could, I could hone. Kent! The central character is Natalie, played by Cameron Diaz, who goes into a panic when she finds her ex-lover dead and naked in bed in her vacation home, just as her newly acquired husband is returning home from an overnight fishing trip. On location, Cameron Diaz found herself repeatedly in deep water as the bewildered Natalie, struggling to escape from a husband who'd become quite nasty and wants to kill her. He chases me around the island, and it's pretty absurd if you think about it. It's, it's, um, it's this wild, crazy chase all over the island, and I'm running for my life and trying to figure out exactly what happened. It's, it's, a, it's a twister, you know, it takes a lot of twists and turns. One twist involves a scene reminiscent of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the film definitely has an absurd quality to it. Every time you expect something to happen, the opposite happens. And the characters uh, keep getting more and more insane. And, um, and in that insanity, they're also really likable because they're, they're very funny and, and desperate. Oh, you are going to pay for this crime. got to catch me first. The manic husband, George, is played by Harvey Keitel, who's constantly scheming to get rid of the dead body and Natalie. It's been two years since Head Above Water was shot here on location in New England, and its transition to the big screen has been far from smooth. In America, it first appeared on pay TV earlier this year, and then in June, it played in just a handful of cinemas to rather lackluster reviews. American moviegoers and critics found the picture's dark humor hard to fathom, no doubt disappointing Jim Wilson, who felt, at least during production, that Head Above Water was the right vehicle for his directorial debut. I'm really happy I've done this film. There's very few films that I think I could direct, very few. I could never direct any of the ones that I've produced. They're too big, they're too, I don't know, they just don't quite strike me as this. So I, I like the more intimate tales about character and getting to know what, what makes them tick and and, um, and this is just the right size. It's not overwhelming, and I feel pretty comfortable here on this setting with these people. Head Above Water's backers, mindful of the film's troubled history, are now hoping the small black comedy will not be lost on British audiences. You know, I think Cameron Diaz looks more beautiful in Head Above Water than she did in My Best Friend's Wedding. Could it be that in the previous film her looks were played down so as not to risk upstaging the star? Surely not. What an unworthy thought. I'm ashamed of you. Anyway, Head Above Water opens here on October the 3rd. Now, though, for Deep Crimson, a Mexican film by Arturo Ripstein, inspired by a true story known as the Lonely Hearts murder case. In Ripstein's version, the tale is told as black comedy, developing inexorably into tragedy and horror. In a small town in Mexico in 1949, Regina Orozco, an overweight, no, nah, let's not kid around, a fat, lovelorn single mother of two with bad breath, answers a Lonely Hearts ad placed by Daniel Jimenez Cacho. He's a con man, a downwardly mobile gigolo, plagued by migraine and obsessively conscious of his own baldness. This is a match pair of emotional cripples, and Roscoe's need for love is so great that although she realizes Jimenez Cacho lives by preying on lonely women, she abandons her children to be with him. And he's so moved by the idea that anyone would sacrifice anything worthwhile for him that they become lovers. Now, Orozco, posing as his sister, joins him in his scams, hunting down vulnerable widowed marks. But because she cannot bear to see her man in the arms of another woman, she takes to murdering their victims. And so they continue their murderous rampage until Nemesis overtakes them when they target Veronica Merchant.
She too is a widow, potentially rich, but also young and pretty with a small daughter. And as Jimenez Cacho goes about wooing her, Orozco realizes that Merchant is a far greater threat to her own security than any of her predecessors. It's now that the comedy in the black comedy slips away and the blackness takes over. Ripstein's direction and the two central performances make the fat lady and her follically challenged lover chillingly believable people. In its way, Deep Crimson is a love story, but this is a love so twisted and sick that it can only be expressed in bloodshed and human sacrifice. Incidentally, the same story, The Lonely Hearts Murders, also inspired the film The Honeymoon Killers some 30 years ago. <laughs> No ves que soy un mico. Es mi secreto. Nadie sabe que soy deforme. Yo vivo de mi cara. Es culpa de la puta migraña que me saca de aquí. ¿Qué dicen los médicos? <risa> Nervios dicen. Para ellos es fácil. Aguántese y se le pasan solo. Y yo trato y trato y nada. No, no necesito tu lástima. Te dieron celos. Celos de gorda. Por eso hiciste lo que hiciste. Y ahora... Necesito tu lástima. Necesito mi peluca. My Best Friend's Wedding, Career Girls, Photographing Fairies and Deep Crimson all open on Friday. And details of this programme are found on CFAX page 542. Next week, Jodie Foster has a close encounter of a weird kind in contact, while John Bon Jovi presents himself as the leading man and Robert Carlyle co-stars with Ray Winston in Face. Meanwhile, and to remind you that despite all evidence to the contrary in this week's films, in the movies these days, FX rules OK, here's a clip from Spawn, a malevolent thriller derived from a comic book in which the human characters are totally overwhelmed by special and digitally animated effects. So what else is new? Goodbye. What's your name? Spawn. I'm Cyan. You have your mother's eyes. I knew her a long time ago. Let's get you back to your mother. My, my, my. What a pretty little dress. I wonder if she's got it in my sash. Spawn is funny. He's our man. If he can't kill him, no one can. Yeah. S to the P to the H to the 1. S to the P to the H to the 1. Go funny. Go funny. Fool! I put you on Earth to make sure Spawn keeps his end of the bargain. Why'd you pick him to lead the army anyway? What are you thinking? It should be me. It should be me. I had the tenure. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And that's exactly the kind of talk we don't tolerate around here, right, Buzz? Enough! Spawn must choose to murder Wynn and release the virus. Then my army will be complete. Now, now, Buzz... This is your last chance. 